Good morning, afternoon, evening. Dr. Richardson here. Lecture 8, genes and protein synthesis. No, not the genes you wear when you go out. We're talking about genes in your DNA. We're going to talk all about that today and how we make proteins. We talked about in previous lectures that um, all living things have DNA. We've talked in previous lectures about the four organic molecules found in living organisms, and one of those four is nucleic acids. Well, DNA is a nucleic acid. It's a polymer, and it's made out of monomers called nucleotides. And nucleotides come in four types or flavors, A, T, G, and C. And we talked about how in the DNA molecule, uh, A's and T's bind together and C's and G's bind together in this double helix. You can look back at lecture four if you want to refresh your memory on that. We also talked about how DNA carries the code or the blueprint of life. And what that means is, just like when you're building a building, you have to have a blueprint to tell you how to build the building, our bodies have a blueprint for how to make us. Our hair, our skin, our nails, our heart, our lungs, all of that, our bones. And so DNA is carrying this blueprint. And it, the DNA blueprint can make the whole copy of the individual from just one copy of DNA. And DNA actually makes or is the blueprint for proteins. Our whole bodies are made up of proteins. And so again, the DNA is a blueprint to make proteins that then make up your body. Take a look at this picture here. Uh, enzymes. Enzymes are molecules that help chemical reactions happen. Those are proteins. Your brain and nervous system made up of proteins. There's proteins in your blood. Your hair and your nails are made of proteins. Muscles made of proteins. Even your immune system, antibodies that help fight off bacteria and viruses are made of proteins. So your body needs millions and millions and millions and may probably billions of proteins and those are made using the DNA as a blueprint to tell what proteins to make. And so this information or these instructions are carried in the DNA in genes. Genes. Now what is a gene? Well, a gene is a piece of DNA that occupies a specific location on a chromosome. So let's take a break and look at our pictures here and kind of orient ourselves to what we're talking about today. Here's a cell, plasma membrane. It's a eukaryotic cell because here's our nucleus with the DNA inside. And if we took that nucleus with the DNA and we blew it up, this is what we would see. What we have are chromosomes. And these chromosomes are pieces of DNA. And in humans, Homo sapiens, you and me, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. 23 pairs, 23 times 2 is 46. So humans have 46 total chromosomes, but they come in pairs, and we have 23 pairs. So what you see here is they look like just lines, but they are supposed to represent our chromosomes. And we number the pairs. So this would be pair number one, pair number two, three, four, five, six, all the way to pair number 23. Now you notice the first 22 pairs are just lines and this 23rd pair has an XX. That's because the 23rd pair 
of our chromosomes are our sex chromosomes. What determines our birth gender? If we have XX, we are female. If we have XY, we are born with the male gender. So just dipping our toes in the water, refreshing our memory on chromosomes and DNA. And then this is just the same as what I've drawn. There's our cell, there's the nucleus. If we blow it up, those little blue things there are these chromosomes. And if we blew that up even more, we would see that double helix with the A's and T's and the C's and G's, those nucleotides binding together. Now you see on the slide there, each chromosome, each of our 46 chromosomes, has a large number of genes on it. Between 200 and 2,000 genes on each chromosome. Let's get a little bit better of an idea of what a gene is before we go to a little video that would help. So <clears throat> we are showing you our 23 pairs. Now let's focus in just randomly on this pair, pair number six, right here. I circled it, and now on my next drawing, we're going to imagine we're blowing it up. We're zooming in on chromosome pair number six. So let's zoom in. Now, here's pair number six, just drawn as a couple lines. The first thing to know is that in our 23 pairs of chromosomes, we inherited one chromosome from mom and one from dad. So for each pair of chromosomes, we inherited one from mom and one from dad. Now, it says here that a gene is a piece of DNA, a section of DNA that occupies a specific location on a chromosome. So now in red, I've just randomly drawn a line right here. And these lines represent the place where the gene is, the location on the chromosome where that gene is. I don't know what it's a gene for yet. It's a gene for some type of protein. But right now we're just orienting ourselves to the understanding that on our chromosomes, there are locations where there are genes. And for every pair of chromosomes we have, we inherited one from mom and one from dad. Now, let's take these chromosomes and zoom in even farther. And if we zoom in even farther, we get to this hopefully familiar now double helix. It's two strands bonded together and then it kind of twists on each other. And so there's a chromosome there. And here's a chromosome here. We're zoomed in all the way now. And now you can see the actual nucleotides that make up the gene that I am highlighting here. You see a C, a G, an A, a T, an A, and a C. It's a short gene. It's only six nucleotides long. C, G, a, T, A, C. Hopefully you can see that. And the interesting thing is, is that in your pairs, where you got one from mom, one from dad, in the exact same spot on both chromosomes will be the same gene. I'll say that again. On each pair of chromosomes in the exact same place on each chromosome will be a gene for the same protein. Let's pretend this is a gene to make an antibody, uh, a molecule in your immune system that helps you fight bacteria and viruses. And this is a blueprint instructions for making an antibody. 
and uh, let's say it's on pair number six and it's in this exact spot right here so where the antibody gene will be on the chromosome you got from mom C G A T A C in the same spot on the chromosome pair that you got from dad you will have also a gene for antibody and you notice C G A T A C same six nucleotides on both chromosomes. All right, good. Now, in this third picture, all that I've done is it's the same picture from here, see? The same two chromosomes. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those six nucleotides and I'm just going to write them below. It's as if I'm pulling out the gene and stretching it out straight. Pulling out the gene and stretching it out so it's straight. And now you see the C G A T A C that I got from here. C G A T -A -C. A C and I've just stretched it out so you can see it laying out and I did the same with the chromosome over here just pulled it out and laid it out C G A T A C so this pattern of nucleotides is is the blueprint it is the instructions for making let's say an antibody protein okay so hopefully these pictures help you to visualize what we're talking today. We zoomed in all the way and now we have our gene there. A piece of DNA that occupies a specific location on a chromosome and it is the blueprint for making some type of protein. Lots of thousands of different proteins so I'm not going to ask you on what chromosome is the gene for antibodies. That's not the point. The point is understanding that genes are spaces of DNA on chromosomes and they are the blueprint for making proteins. Okay, good. Now what I'd like to do is have you take a quick break because we're going to look at a couple videos about what a gene is. Now, you might be asking though before we go to our YouTube break here. Well, okay, cool. We got genes and all that, but how does that gene become an antibody? How does the gene become the protein? Well, the genes have to go through a process called protein synthesis. Synthesize, make proteins. So these genes have to go through protein synthesis to make the actual protein that they are the blueprint for. All right? Okay, good. Ideas swirling around? Let's try to solidify them by watching a couple of videos. They are short videos, about three minutes each, but I love them and have been using them for a long time because I believe they really nail it in what is a gene. So please take a moment to watch this one, then take a minute to watch this one, and then we'll come back and we're going to talk about making proteins, protein synthesis. Okay, back with us. You can watch the videos more than once. Um, if it's confusing, please watch it again. These are concepts that you really have to have down, understanding what the chromosomes are, that the genes are on the chromosomes, and that they're, you know, stretches, pieces of DNA, and that they go through a process called protein synthesis to make the actual hair, skin, nails, tissue, whatever. All right, now, we are next going to go through the process of protein synthesis. And like 
glucose breakdown, and many other biological processes. There are often several steps that we have to go through. And protein synthesis is no different. So protein synthesis is made up of three steps or stages or events, and we need to know what they are and what's happening in each step. Now, as hopefully you know by now, Richardson is really big on uh, showing you things in different ways. So I'll give you some words, give you a drawing, maybe show you a video, maybe do a table. So for the protein synthesis, we're going to use this drawing, but I would also encourage you to consider using a table to help you study whatever works best for you. So the three steps or events in protein synthesis are transcription, translation, and processing of the protein. You can make a mnemonic out of that if you like and watch lecture one if you want to know what a mnemonic is. So transcription, translation, and processing of the protein. Now uh, I'm going to flip back and forth from the slide to the picture to the table, but if you want to set up a table, you want to get your three steps, transcription, translation, and protein processing. And remember, Richardson is really big on what is happening and where it's happening in the cell. So we'll talk about those and we'll go over the picture and the slides. Now, let's orient you to this picture here. You see transcription, you see translation, and the protein processing is complex. It's not drawn in the picture too hard to, it, the picture would be too messy. But you see the stages here. And at the top, we're starting with the gene. Now, this gene is longer than the gene I showed you in the, my previous drawing. It only was six base pairs. This gene is a little longer, but it's still made of A's and T's and C's and G's. The reason you don't see a uh, double helix here is because, again, we've pulled out just the gene, just the sequence of nucleotides that make up that gene. We don't have the double helix anymore. We're just looking at the gene. What first is going to happen is a gene here gets transcribed into mRNA, messenger RNA. Okay, what is she talking about? Well, remember, the gene is a blueprint. So you have to think of it like um, a document, and you're going to make copies from it, okay? So we use the gene as a template or a blueprint, and we make an mRNA molecule. So using the gene as a blueprint, we're going to make mRNA, and that's transcription. Making mRNA from a gene. But the mRNA is not the end of the story. It's not the protein, right? So then we have to do translation. And here is where the messenger RNA now becomes the blueprint for making the protein. And so mRNA is translated into a protein, again, using these nucleotides, using the code on the mRNA. We then will bring in AAs, amino acids. Amino acids are the monomers of a protein, one and another and another. And these little T-shaped things act as like Uber cars, and they'll bring the amino acids in to translation. And then what happens is these amino acids are now sitting next to each other, and a bond forms. 
Remember, covalent or ionic bonds. And bonds form, this by the way is an endergonic reaction. We're building a large molecule from the separate pieces. And here then is the protein. Now that might not look like uh, hair or skin or nails or an antibody, but a protein at its molecular level is a group of amino acid monomers bonded together to make a polymer. So these are the three steps. Transcription, making mRNA from the gene, and translation, making the protein from the mRNA. And we have to remember, we start with DNA, then we make mRNA, and then we make the protein. This is called the central dogma of biology because what it, I, I don't know why it's called that, but that is the flow. In order to get a protein, you need mRNA, and you make mRNA from the DNA, so it always flows. Information, making protein, flows from the DNA to mRNA to the final protein. All right. Show you another picture, and then we'll go into a bit more detail. So, as I just said, genetic information flows from DNA to RNA, messenger RNA, to the protein. Let's take a look here. So, here is our cell, and the purple is the nucleus. That's the nucleus. So, here's our DNA in blue, and it's showing you where the gene is. It's this little piece of DNA right here. There's the gene. Now, what you're watching happening first is transcription. The red is the mRNA, messenger RNA, that is created using the nucleotide code, the A's and T's and C's and G's, from that gene right there. It's used as a template, and mRNA forms and now we have the red thing is our mRNA, that's transcription. Now what you see happening is the mRNA is leaving the nucleus. And where is it now? It's in the cytoplasm, all that liquidy, watery stuff inside the cell. And now look what's happening. The red little ribbon thing is kind of moving through this structure here. And now you see this yellow thing being made. And that's translation, making the protein, the yellow thing, using the mRNA as a blueprint, as a plan for making the protein. So transcription, translation. Protein processing is, we're not going to get into a lot of detail there, uh, but that would be the third step. Notice Transcription, where, where is that happening? And again, make a table to help you study. Transcription happens in the nucleus, in the nucleus, okay? And then translation and protein processing happen in the cytoplasm out here, not in the nucleus, okay? All right. Let's have a little bit more detail on transcription. Again, we are making the mRNA, making this polymer using the gene as a template. Now, how exactly does that happen? Well, it's really complicated. Uh, what I want you to keep an eye on is where does it happen in the nucleus? what is happening. We're making a piece of mRNA using the gene as a template, as a plan, blueprint. And just like if you remember back to the cell cycle in lecture four, there is an enzyme 
a polymerase that helps this transcription happen and it opens up the DNA molecule and that's how mRNA is made. Let me go to the picture for a second. So here's your double-stranded DNA molecule, right? Well, we can't make mRNA when the DNA is all double helixed up. So we have to open up the DNA, separate that double helix so that we have our gene exposed. Gene is exposed right here. The big gray egg thing is the RNA polymerase. It's an enzyme, again, that opens up that double helix and exposes the gene. And now what you see is we're making mRNA here. So this is the actual gene down here. And what you see is you see a T, A, G, G, T, T, a, A. And what's happening is nucleotides, little monomers of, MR, of mRNA are floating in and stitching themselves together, bonding themselves together. This is actually also an endergonic reaction. We're making, building a molecule. And then as the molecule is made, it's going to kind of zip right off and, and float off here. So again, transcription. We're taking the gene from the DNA. We're opening up RNA polymerase. And these free-floating nucleotides are going to float in, and they're going to start stitching themselves together to make the mRNA. Now, the key here is the matching bases. mRNA nucleotides are only going to float in and stitch together if they are complementary to the bases on the gene. What? Let's go over here to the picture. Now, you must remember DNA matches C to G and A to T. We talked about that in lecture four. By now, it should be like, you know, like the back of your hand. C matches to G and A matches to T. Well, there's always something new. And when we're talking about RNA, not DNA, but RNA, there is no T. So wherever you would expect a T, there's a U. So I'm going to go through this now to help you understand what I'm talking about. So let's pretend we have this gene and we are making our piece of mRNA. How do we know A's and U's and so how do we know? Well, we use this and we do complementary. So you know A to T. So when you have a T on the gene, an A nucleotide will come in for the mRNA. Here we have an A. Remember, since there's no T in RNA, the matching complementary, we say it's complementing. The complementary base pair to the A will be a U. T, A will come in. A, U will come in. There's an A, U comes in. There's a G, C. There's a C, G comes in. G to C, A and U, T and A. I'm hoping that you can see and predict what base will be placed in the mRNA by looking at the gene. Very important. Must be able to tell me what base would go in the mRNA if I told you what's the base on the gene. Okay? All right. Rewind this and watch it again 
if you're still confused. But in order to make the mRNA, we use the gene and we pop in a complementary base pair to make the mRNA using the base pair on the DNA as a guide. And remembering C to G and A to U, A to U in mRNA. And that is transcription. Okay? All right. Transcription, what are we doing? What's happening? DNA, we're making mRNA. Making mRNA from DNA happens in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is. The whole reason we have to do two steps is because the translation and processing happens in the cytoplasm and the DNA cannot leave the nucleus. Your DNA never leaves the nucleus. That's why we have to make mRNA, send it out to make the protein. If the DNA left every time you met, you wouldn't have any DNA. The blueprint would be gone. So it's like making a copy of the blueprint and using that to build your molecule instead of using the original plan. All righty. Translation, second step. We are now going to actually be making the protein from the mRNA. This happens in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus. As we saw in our earlier pick, once we make the mRNA, the red little ribbon thing, it leaves the nucleus and translation happens in the cytoplasm. So we're making the protein from the mRNA and it does happen in the cytoplasm. Now let's look at translation in a bit more detail. All right, so here's our nucleus, right? Here's our gene, right? Here's our mRNA that we just made in translation. Here is the mRNA leaving the nucleus going into the cytoplasm, and this is where translation will happen. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Now, you see this blue kind of circular molecule here? That's called a ribosome, and that is a molecule that clamps on or grabs on to the mRNA. It's kind of like Hey, let me hold you down because we're going to do translation, okay? So the ribosome clamps on to the mRNA, holds it in place. The next thing that happens is these little Uber cars with these, see these green balls? Those are the amino acids, the monomers that are going to make up this new protein. And these T, they're called tRNA because they're the shape of a T, they're going to bring in these separate amino acids, and they're going to park themselves right here on the ribosome. And the parking is the checking. Am I putting in the right amino acid for this new protein that I'm making? And that's the, the complicated part of translation is those tRNAs parking and the checking. Let me show you another slide that'll go into a bit more detail. Now, as I said, ribosomes, molecules made of two subunits, two pieces that kind of grasp or clasp or hold the mRNA molecule. And they have what are called docking sites, like parking places for these transfer RNAs to carry in these separate amino acids, and then they are checked and linked together to make a new protein. Again, we will have this complementary base pairing. You have to remember C to G and A to U in order to understand uh, that the correct amino acid 
has come in. Let's take a look at another picture, then a video. Don't panic. It's complicated. The key is going over it and over it and over it. All right, let's go really blown up close here. Now what we see is here's our mRNA, and we can see the, the code here, right, the nucleotides on the mRNA. We see our ribosome, two pieces clamping on to the mRNA. And here are our Uber cars, our tRNA, called transfer RNA. And there are weird shapes. Here's the amino acid, amino acid, amino acid that it's carrying, the passenger in the Uber car. But at the top is this anticodon. What the heck is that? Notice it has nucleotides, CCA. This one is AUA. This one is ACG. And what happens is the anticodon from the tRNA parks in this docking site and checks that the nucleotides on the mRNA are complementary. A to U, A to U, A to U. Oh, we got a good complement here. Okay, I'm going to drop this guy off now. And then what happens is the tRNAs will float out. They're empty now, empty Uber cars. And they'll go out, pick up more amino acids, and bring them in. So again, let's just look. You see, there's a G on the mRNA, so there's a C here. There's a U on the mRNA, so there's an A on the tRNA. There's a G on the mRNA, so there's a G on a C on the tRNA. Complementary base pairing. So one more time, T, uh, mRNA leaves nucleus, comes out to cytoplasm. Ribosomes clamp on. Uber car, transfer RNAs, come in, park in the parking spot, check for complementary base pairing. We got a good match? Good. I'm going to drop off this amino acid, and they're going to bond together bond together. It's like stitching together the protein as the tRNAs drop off the amino acids. Fascinating, fascinating process. Again, I didn't draw the anticodons here on the tRNA because I wanted this picture to be much more simple. But you understand these tRNAs would have these anticodons and they'd be checking to make sure. And let's Ask ourselves, if there's a C on this mRNA, A, U, and C, what should be the anticodons here? Well, if this is an A, the first one should be A. Hopefully you said U. This one's a U, so the second anticodon would be an A. And this is a C, so the third anticodon would be a G. Good. And you can quiz yourself just by going through and telling yourself which these would be. Again, they're carrying these amino acids, these monomers. Once they check and the anticodons are everybody's matching and happy, the tRNA will dump this amino acid and it will leave. Empty Uber car, go pick up another one and come on back. And then here we have the protein as the amino acid monomers are stitching themselves together. All right, great. Please watch this quick little video. Uh, it's really a nice animation showing this kind of uh, anti-codon and the, the matching. So please take a break. It's just a minute or two long to show you the translation because I think that is the harder part than the transcription to understand. All right. Uh, in our table, translation is going from mRNA to a protein. It happens in the cytoplasm. Finally, we have completion of the protein as this little string of amino acids now bonded together uh, leaves the ribosome complex. It starts to do some pretty complicated stuff. It twists and turns. This all depends on the functional groups, those um, reactive atoms that are doing 
uh, chemical reactions. We end up seeing, you know, the primary structure, just the amino acids all kind of linked together, but we can then have the protein might fold or twist on itself, and it can have a lot of complex structure to the protein. We're not going to go into the details of that. It's really more for bio majors to go into all of the ways that the proteins are processed. Uh, but for your table, all I really expect you to know is it's getting the protein ready to do whatever its final job is, whether it's a collagen protein that's going to be in our hair or uh, our nails or our skin, um, whether it's an antibody that's going to uh, go through the immune system and fight viruses and bacteria, whether it's a hemoglobin protein, a protein in our blood that helps deliver oxygen, whatever the final job is, the protein processing happens in the cytoplasm and it's getting the protein ready to do its work. All right? Okay, good. Protein synthesis. Now, let me ask you a question to make you think. Well, the answer's on the slide anyway. But if we humans have about 24,000 genes and a copy to make those genes is in every cell of our body, except for our sperm and egg cells, do you think every cell is making 20,000 proteins at a time? No. Depending on the cell, and that cell's job, a skin cell, an eye cell, a hair cell, a liver cell, a lung cell, depending on that cell's job, it will only be doing protein synthesis to make a small number of proteins at any given time. In addition, some cells will make certain proteins all the time. For example, receptor proteins in the plasma membrane. Uh, a, a cell always has to be taking stuff in, so it's always going to need receptor uh, proteins. But other proteins, other genes, might never be expressed or made into a protein. For example, casein is a milk protein, and it is made in the cells of the female breast, but only for a short period of that woman's life when she's breastfeeding. After that, the cells will go, oh, we don't need to make that anymore. Let's not waste our energy making stuff that we don't need. So, must remember, not all cells are making all their proteins. It's never going to happen. Too much energy. So depending on the job of the cell, a small number of proteins are being made at a certain time as that cell needs to for its job. And cells can start and stop making proteins at different points in the lifespan of that organism. Fascinating stuff regulating this protein synthesis. It's not all go all the time. So let's just make what we need for what cell we are. All right. Uh, very exciting new field called epigenetics. I don't know if you've ever heard this word before. I've only heard the word in the past few years. But guess what? I don't know if this is good news or bad news. Your environment we now know, affects what genes are expressed. That's heavy. Your environment can affect what genes turn on and make their proteins. And pollution, stress, smoking, and poor eating habits can cause certain genes to turn on and off. So it's not just, I got what mom and dad gave me, my genes are my genes. Your environment 
has an effect on what genes are being expressed. And if you eat poorly and, and you know, stress and don't take care of yourself, the changes in your genetics can be passed on to your kids. So now more than ever, it's really important for us to take care of ourselves because we now know we're not just passing the genes we got from our mind, passing on. We're changing our genes because of our environment. Okay? If you want to hear a little more about this, Mr. Anderson, his video is a bit long, but if you watch the first three minutes, he's going to talk a little bit about epigenetics. Fascinating stuff. All right. I want to finish this lecture by asking you a question. What if there's a mutation in this gene? What if there's a mutation? What if, for example, you see this A right here. What if instead of this A right here, right there, what if instead of that A, a mutation happens and it becomes a C? Uh-oh. Well, if this is a C instead of an A, is that going to change the mRNA? Hopefully you said yes. And if this is changed to a C, then on the mRNA we would have a G. And then let me ask you, if there's a different, if there's a different base here, is that going to affect which tRNA and which amino acid will go into the protein? The idea here is if you make a change here, it's going to affect that, and that's going to affect this, and this is going to affect that. So a mutation is going to change a lot of things. But the question is, what would that protein do? Would that protein made as a result of a mutation in the gene, would that protein work the same? Hmm. Hmm. Genetic mutations. How does gene mutation affect protein synthesis? Well, if the nucleotide sequence of the DNA is changed, for example, if that is changed from an A to a C, well, now we would call the gene an allele. An allele is an alternative form of a gene that comes about when there's a mutation. So we're going to start using that word allele in the place of gene because the truth is is that gene mutations happen all the time so we have different alleles and all that means is the gene has had some kind of mutation yes a gene mutation would result in a different base being put in here yes and yes, this could result in a different amino acid being put into the protein. I say it could result because translation is tricky and that anti-codon, sometimes multiple amino acids meet the same codon. I don't want you to worry about that, but I want you to focus on the fact that if there's a mutation in the gene, we now call it an allele. It will result in a different nucleotide being put into the mRNA and very possibly will affect and change the amino acid that's put into the protein. And there's three outcomes when we have a gene mutation like this. The first is this protein is now not going to work. If it is, let's say, uh, antibody uh, protein, and its, its job is to 
kill bacteria when you get cut or bacteria gets in your system, it's not going to work at all. And if an antibody doesn't work, uh-oh, if that protein is essential for that thing to stay alive, that organism, it could die. But a second possibility is no effect. Maybe that one amino acid if it was instead of amino acid A, now it's this amino acid B, might be no effect. It's possible there would be no effect on the protein, even if there was a gene mutation. And the third possibility is the most exciting. What if the protein works better? What if instead of being able to, to uh, kill bacteria and viruses, it can kill protistin fungi too. What if it becomes the super antibody molecule and it can kill any kind of foreign, uh, you know, material that enters your body? Or what if we're talking about a muscle protein and instead of being able to jump 12 feet in the air uh, or 12 inches in the air, now that organism can jump 16 inches into the air. What if instead of running, uh, I don't know, four miles in a minute, uh, the muscle protein makes it so that that human can run a three-minute mile? This is really exciting. What if a gene mutation made the protein work better? Fascinating, right? Just something to think about. Now, how do mutations happen? Two ways. During DNA replication, we talked about mitosis in lecture four. Every time the cell divides, it has to make a copy of its DNA, right, to do mitosis. Errors happen during DNA replication all the time, but most are repaired. Something else that can cause mutation is our environment, as we talked about, epigenetics, chemicals in the body, uh, radiation, the sun, remember you get skin cancer from the sun, these things can also cause genetic mutations. Now this is a complicated slide but the reason I want to show it to you is that it's showing up here all the different damages that can happen to DNA, all the different reasons that mutations can happen. But just take a look at these lists. Look at all those. See all those things? Those are all lists of DNA mutation repair proteins. So we even have proteins that fix DNA mutations. So again, nothing to memorize here, just to appreciate the fact that DNA mutations are happening all the time, but we've got a couple dozen proteins that fix DNA mutations. And this picture just shows uh, the different types of things that can fix. If you have a mismatch, like instead of C to G, it's C to A or something, that can be fixed. What if uh, they put the wrong base in? Instead of putting in a, a T, it was supposed to be a G. That can be fixed. What if the base itself is not there? That can be fixed. What if there's some weird molecule kind of attached to the base so that the, the DNA can't, you know, bond? That can be fixed. What if there's a break in the DNA molecule? That can be fixed. And what if there's a cross-linking? A base is not matching to its one straight across, but it's matching to the one next to it. So all of these types of mutations can be repaired. Phew, I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of relief that that stuff can be fixed. So now we want you to close this last slide by transitioning to think about this. If you have a gene that mutates in your skin cell, your hair cells, your fingernails, your elbow, your brain, 
are you going to pass that mutation on to your offspring? Hmm. Well, what is it that you actually pass on to your offspring, your kids? You give them your sperm or your egg. So, a mutation in a gene must happen in a cell that will become egg or sperm in order for that mutation to be passed to your kids. If you get skin cancer on your skin, that's not in your sperm, it's not in your egg. If you get a mutation in a brain cell, that's far, far, far from your sperm and egg. So keep in mind, mutations can happen all over the body, but it's only when a mutation happens in a cell that's going to be a sperm or an egg cell for that mutation to be passed on to your kids. Okay? Now, we do a process called meiosis to make sperm and egg, and we're going to talk about how mutations can be passed on to kids through meiosis, through inheritance in our next lecture. And after our next lecture, lecture nine, we'll be done talking about DNA. All right. This is a bit of a complex lecture. Watch it again if you need to. Cute little karaoke protein synthesis. I love this. Watch it. It's fun. Helps you study, remember, get it in there. And, of course, this lecture will be attached. Dr. Richardson signing off, lecture eight.